Hello, I'm Sarah Tallarico. I'm an epidemiologist with the Molecular Epidemiology Activity in the Division of Tuberculosis Elimination at CDC. I will be presenting the following set of training slides focused on the use of whole genome sequencing, or WGS, for investigating recent TB transmission, along with colleagues Tambi Shaw and Martin Silness, from the TB Control Branch at the California Department of Public Health. At the end of this presentation, participants will be able to describe key differences between conventional genotyping and WGS, what is being represented on a phylogenetic tree, how WGS is used to assess whether patients are potentially linked by recent transmission, why WGS alone cannot be used to infer direction of transmission, and how TB control programs can use WGS analysis in an investigation. This presentation is divided into three parts. Part one is an introduction to using WGS for detection and investigation of recent TB transmission. I will cover the goals of TB molecular epidemiology, current genotyping methods, use of WGS for investigating TB transmission, and a guide for interpreting results of WGS analysis. Part two will be case studies using WGS to investigate TB cluster alerts in California. Martin and Tambi will present two case studies with WGS and EpiData. One is a confirmed outbreak, and one is a refuted outbreak. Then, in Part 3, I will briefly describe the plans for transition to universal prospective WGS, a separate presentation covering the details of how universal prospective WGS will be implemented will be made available in the future. First, I will go over some background for how to use WGS for detection and investigation of recent TB transmission. TB is caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis and is transmitted through the airborne route. 5% of people who are infected develop active TB disease within two years. These people are infectious and can carry on the chain of transmission. The other 95% develop latent TB, which is not infectious. However, about 5% of people with latent TB will reactivate and develop active disease at some point in their life. So two main strategies for eliminating TB are detecting and treating latent TB infection and detecting and interrupting ongoing transmission, which is the focus for today's presentation. TB molecular epidemiology targets recent transmission with the goal of reducing the burden of TB by identifying where transmission is currently occurring and interrupting it. The challenge is we need to distinguish TB cases that are due to recent transmission from cases that were infected long ago and are just now developing active disease. We do this by combining molecular, clinical, and epidemiologic data to detect, investigate, and monitor recent transmission. We combine molecular data with clinical and epi data because there are challenges when it comes to trying to rely exclusively on epi data to investigate TB transmission. The fact that transmission is airborne can make it difficult to assess exposure. Assessing exposure in congregate settings can be very complex as well. TB also can have infectious periods that span years, and for that reason, patient recall may be incomplete or unreliable. And TB transmission often occurs in impoverished or marginalized communities that are difficult to access. For these reasons, it is helpful to use genotyping which can provide additional, complementary information to aid detection and investigation of transmission. By identifying cases with genetically similar M. tuberculosis isolates that are more likely to be linked by transmission. Genotyping examines the DNA of M. tuberculosis isolates from TB patients. The M. tuberculosis bacteria from a TB patient is called the patient's isolate. Bacteria, including M. tuberculosis, have DNA called a bacterial genome. DNA is made up of four different nucleotides, abbreviated A, T, C, and G. The order of these nucleotides in the genome is the DNA sequence. The genome of M. tuberculosis is over 4.4 million nucleotides long. Genotyping can be used to identify TB patients who are more likely to be linked by recent transmission. Changes in the DNA, called mutations, occur over time, so M. tuberculosis bacteria don't all have the exact same DNA sequence. At the time of infection, the person transmitting the infection, 
and the person acquiring the infection will have M. tuberculosis with identical DNA sequence. Genotyping analyzes DNA to identify TB patients with similar M. tuberculosis genomes who are more likely to be linked by recent transmission. In this schematic, transmission is occurring between these two people at the top, and they have M. tuberculosis isolates with the same genotype, shown in black. But this person at the bottom is not part of that transmission chain and has an M. tuberculosis isolate with a different genotype, shown in green. CDC uses M. tuberculosis genotyping data to detect clusters of possible recent transmission. Two or more isolates with the same genotype are considered clustered. This schematic on the right is showing M. tuberculosis genotypes in a community, and we can identify a green cluster and a black cluster. Algorithms that consider time and space are then used to identify clustered cases that may be due to recent transmission. And CDC has developed cluster detection methods for this purpose. One method is the LLR cluster alert that detects an unexpected increase in concentration of a genotype in a jurisdiction during a three-year time period. Another type of alert is for surveillance of large outbreaks defined as 10 or more cases in a three-year period related by recent transmission. Current M. tuberculosis genotyping methods cover only about 1% of the genome and are based on differences in repetitive regions within the M. tuberculosis genome. The current method combines the results of two assays, spoligotyping and MIRU VNTR, to give an M. tuberculosis gen type. Specifically, spoligotyping is based on the presence or absence of 43 spacer sequences in a direct repeat region of the genome. And Miro VNTR is based on differences in the number of copies of tandem repeats at 24 regions or loci of the genome. Isolates that have the exact same spoligotype and 24 locus Miro VNTR pattern are assigned the same gen type. However, gen typing provides relatively low resolution for examining the genetic relatedness of isolates because it only examines a small portion, about 1% of the genome. The regions of the genome examined by gen typing may not change within a time frame that is useful for understanding recent transmission. This makes interpretation difficult when there has been substantial past transmission of a gen type in a community because it is harder to distinguish cases due to reactivation of infection that was acquired during the past transmission versus cases due to recent transmission and it is harder to distinguish separate chains of recent transmission among cases with the same gen type. WGS can provide added resolution for examining genetic relatedness of isolates by expanding coverage of the genome to about 90% compared to the 1% that is covered by gen typing. This captures much more of the genetic changes that occur. CDC has been performing WGS and phylogenetic analysis retrospectively for select gen type clusters and has analyzed more than 100 clusters nationally to date. 2012 is when we first did WGS of a gen type cluster. In 2014, we started performing WGS for all gen type clusters that alerted for large outbreak surveillance. In 2016, we expanded WGS capacity to include other select gen type clusters that could inform public health. This map is showing the number of isolates with whole genome sequencing data for each state or territory, with a total of 2,776 isolates having been sequenced as of August 2017, but retrospective sequencing is still ongoing. The whole genome sequencing data is used to perform a whole genome single nucleotide polymorphism analysis, or WGSNP analysis. A single nucleotide polymorphism, or SNP as we call them, is a mutation at a single position in A, T, C, or G in the DNA sequence. WGSNP analysis uses WGS data to identify SNPs that are useful for examining the genetic relationship among isolates. SNPs that are identified in the WGSNP analysis are mapped onto a phylogenetic tree to diagram the genetic relationship among isolates. The phylogenetic tree can be used to focus and inform epidemiologic investigation of the cases. 
WG SNP analysis is done by first aligning the isolate sequence reads to a reference genome. We use M tuberculosis H37RV. This is shown on the right where the sequence reads for the isolate are in black and they are being matched up to the sequence of the reference genome shown in gray. Then, SNPs relative to the reference genome, H37RV, are identified. This is shown here where the isolate sequence has an A at this position, where H37RV has a T. Then the next step is that uninformative and unreliable SNPs are filtered out to produce a list of high-quality SNPs. What we filter out are SNPs that are present in all the isolates in the analysis, because if the SNP is present in all the isolates in the cluster being analyzed, the SNP is not informative for understanding the genetic relationships among the isolates. We also filter out SNPs that are identified because of assembly errors, which means the sequence read wasn't aligned to the correct place of the reference genome. And low-confidence SNPs. For example, if there are very few sequence reads that cover the SNP position, then lastly, the high-quality SNPs are mapped onto a phylogenetic tree to diagram the genetic relationships between the isolates. Here is a guide for interpreting the phylogenetic tree. On this tree, the isolates are shown as circles called nodes. These would usually be labeled with the isolate's accession number. Isolates that have the same genome type are displayed together in one node. Nodes are connected by lines that are proportional in length to the number of SNPs that differ between the isolates, and the lines are labeled with the number of SNPs. You will see that the tree also has a node labeled MRCA. MRCA stands for Most Recent Common Ancestor. The MRCA is not an actual isolate, but a hypothetical genome type from which all isolates on the tree are descended. And so the MRCA serves as a reference point for examining the direction of genetic change, which is shown with these blue arrows. On this tree, if we start up top at the MRCA and move down this branch on the right, there are three SNPs shown in yellow, and this isolate has those three SNPs. But if we were to move down this other branch on the left, we come to this first node that has two isolates, and these two isolates don't have those three yellow SNPs but they have two different SNPs shown in blue. And then from there, we can move up the branch, and there is an isolate that has those same two blue SNPs plus one more SNP shown in purple. If we start back at the node with the two isolates and move down the branch, the two isolates down at the bottom have the two blue SNPs plus two red SNPs, and then each one has one additional SNP as well. One has a green SNP, and one has a dark blue SNP. And you will see at the bottom of the tree that trees also sometimes have a branching point with no circle. This is called a hypothetical node. The hypothetical node represents a hypothetical genome type, but there is no actual isolate with this genome type in the analysis. So in this example, if we start at the node with the two isolates with the two blue SNPs and move down this branch to the hypothetical node, you see that the genome type at the hypothetical node has the two blue SNPs and the two red SNPs, but we don't actually have an isolate with that genome type in the analysis. We use the tree to examine the number of SNPs that differ between the isolates and identify groups of closely related isolates that may be involved in recent transmission, as well as to identify genetically distant isolates that are unlikely to be involved in recent transmission. This helps programs prioritize cases for focus of their epi investigation. SNP thresholds for categorizing M tuberculosis isolates as genetically distant or closely related have not been formally established for CDC's WG SNP analysis yet. Based on CDC's general experiences using WG SNP analysis for investigating recent transmission, Isolates with 0 to 5 SNP differences are considered closely related, and isolates with 6 or more SNP differences are considered genetically distant. SNP thresholds will vary depending on the methods used for the WG SNP analysis and cannot be compared to thresholds used by other groups with different analysis methods. These recommended SNP thresholds may change as CDC's WG SNP analysis methods are further developed or based on results of a formal validation analysis of SNP thresholds. An important consideration to keep in mind 
when looking at these trees is that the phylogenetic trees are not the same as transmission diagrams because directionality of transmission cannot be inferred from WG SNP analysis alone. If we look at the simple tree on the left, isolates A and B are identical, and it's possible that patient A could have transmitted to patient B, or patient B could have transmitted to patient A. Directionality of transmission also cannot be inferred because there could be cases involved in transmission that are not included in the WGS analysis. For the same tree, it is possible that there is no transmission between patient A and B, and transmission was through a third case that does not have an isolate on the tree because they are an undetected case or were culture negative. Another consideration is there could be genetic changes that occur between the time of transmission and collection of the patient's sample. With this tree, it is tempting to think that patient A transmitted to patient B, since isolate B is shown to have evolved from isolate A. That could be true, but it is actually still possible that patient B could have transmitted to patient A. To illustrate this concept with an example, patient B could transmit to patient A in 2015. So both patients have the same genome type in 2015. Patient A's sample is collected about one year later, and no mutations have occurred during that time. Patient B's sample is collected even later, and during the time period between transmission and collection of the sample, patient B could have a mutation, here a T to G, in his infecting strain, which would result in a tree that looks like this on the left. For these reasons, we don't use the trees to try to infer transmission between patients. We use them to identify clusters of cases that may be due to recent transmission. It is also important to remember that it is easier to rule out recent transmission than confirm it using WGS. Even isolates that are closely related or identical by WGS can be due to reactivation. This is because mutations may not occur as frequently during latent infection, and therefore SNPs may not accumulate. So the phylogenetic tree should be used in conjunction with clinical and epidemiologic information to assess recent transmission. In summary, WGS can provide greater resolution than GenType for investigating recent TB transmission. CDC has used WGS retrospectively to examine genetic relatedness of isolates clustered by GenType. WG SNP analysis is performed to produce a phylogenetic tree for examining genetic relationships between isolates in a gen-type cluster, and the phylogenetic tree should be used in tandem with epidemiologic data to identify clusters of closely related isolates that may indicate recent transmission, not to draw conclusions about direction of transmission among individual patients.